My first career was elder care. And from it, I learned the signs that someone is about to die. In early March 2020, my grandma, who was in her 90s and had dementia, started talking about taking a long trip back home. I told my family it was time to say goodbye. So we made travel plans. And then, suddenly, locked in. My sister, the only family member who lived in the same state, insisted on being allowed to visit. The nursing home couldn't do that. They had other clients to protect. But, because it was so early in the pandemic, and because my sister cannot be stopped, they came to an arrangement. My sister moved into the tiny room my grandma lived in for 10 days without leaving once while my grandma died. Grandma didn't die alone, but I couldn't be there. I live over a thousand miles away. I did call her, but I wasn't entirely there. I was having flashbacks for hours per day. Unlike a lot of media depictions, they're not much like hallucinations, at least not for me. It's more like the bad thing just happened five minutes ago. That kind of vivid. And when you spend that much time two inches away from something horrific, you cope. I coped <laughs> by trying to imagine it could have gone differently. What if I'd left earlier? What if I'd said something else? What if I... Pathologic 2 is my favorite game of all time. I saw the trailer about a month before it came out when I didn't have a computer that could run it. This was the game that convinced me I needed to finally join the PC Big Boy Club for Real Gamers. I hadn't even heard of the first one, and aside from looking up whether I needed to play it in order to understand what was going on, no, by the way, I decided I didn't want to be spoiled. There was just something about it that called to me. It's really rare that I get that excited about anything? Yeah, anything. <laughs> um, but because I was that excited, I fully expected to be let down. I wasn't. As hyped as I was, Pathologic 2 blew my expectations out of the water. Now, I'm not here to say Pathologic 2 is the greatest game of all time. I, I don't actually believe that's true, and I'm not a sophisticated enough consumer of games to even describe its flaws in a technical way. I also don't have the stamina to do something comprehensive. I'm just going to pick a couple of themes which spoke to me. Honestly, I think that's a big enough challenge. The biggest obstacle to talking about Pathologic 2, to discuss it or try and sell it to other people, is that it's about so many things. So, really elementary. Let's start with the plot. Artemy Barak is a Menku, part of a cast of indigenous step doctors from a culture called the Kin who live in a remote and newly industrialized town. Artemis studying modern surgery in the capital when he gets a letter from his father asking him to come home. So you hitch a train ride home with this trustworthy guy who falls out of a casket just as the town loses its absolute shit over your father's murder. The townspeople suspect you and start attacking you in the street. 
just as they figure out maybe you didn't do it, the plague breaks out. Your competing goals become to find out who killed your father and to inherit your father's legacy. Whatever that means. You're only half kin and you've been away for a long time. Your father's culture and his role in it are foreign and completely incomprehensible to an outsider. Your clues, which you get when you inherit your dad's stuff, are the names of the seven future leaders of the town, children, and an eighth, the Erduk. Okay, not English, but you can get a translation and a body that contains the universe. Okay, that, that doesn't help. What the fuck does that mean? So you have to divide your limited time between gathering clues, avoiding getting stabbed, trying not to get the plague, saving whoever you can in case they have an answer or they're part of your mission. Oh, and by the way, you have all these meters to babysit, some of which kill you if they deplete all the way. And if they don't, then those empty meters deplete your health, which will kill you. That's the game. Have fun, asshole. Right now, people who have played it are probably a little frustrated with me. Like, yes, that's what it's about. But like, that's not what it's about about. If Pathologic 2 were a novel, I'd call it literary. Not in the sense that literary works are somehow superior to genre works or whatever. No, I mean that the writing and the line level, the presentation, the thematic underpinnings are as important, maybe even more important, to the forward momentum of the story than the literal plot events. For example, Pathologic 2 has a framing device. It begins in media res, which is fancy as Latin for in the middle of things, at the end of the story. You, the player, are being scolded by Mark Immortel, who runs the theater, about your failed run-through of the game. The town is occupied by an army. There are corpses in the street, and the survivors have given up. When you go to beg for more time from the powers that be, they are done. They're discussing how to bomb the town off the map to protect the rest of the country. Game over. The game begins with your failure. And because Mark Immortel is breaking the fourth wall, your inevitable failure as the player, and with you demanding another shot at making it right. Let's take a step back. Why would you play a game where you're going to fail? I suppose technically you fail at all games until you beat them. But narratively here, the game is telling you two things. First, that it's going to be about futility. And second, that it's a horror game. It's here to scare the shit out of you. And my reaction to this was, fuck yes, sign me up. If you speak to people who are not horror fans, they don't really understand this reaction. Horror is scary. At its most skillful, it's harrowing, it's unfair. It makes you feel small and terrified. And all of us horror fans are like, hell yeah, it does. But if that's not your bent, it sounds like I'm enthusing about pain. And that takes some explanation, doesn't it? Stephen King has written two books on craft. One of them, on writing, is his most recent one, and it's more general writing advice. The second one is Dance Macabre, which is about writing horror. A significant portion of each book is memoir. Their meditations on what made him a writer, and more specifically, why he writes horror. Part of that story is a childhood watching movies with rubber-suited monsters who menace helpless blondes. But he also talks about ear infections that required repeated excruciating and traumatic lancing of his eardrums. The puncturing of my eardrum was pain beyond the world. I screamed. There was a sound inside my head, a loud kissing sound. Hot fluid ran out of my ear. It was as if I had started to cry out of the wrong hole. King also spends a significant portion of his memoirs talking about his alcoholism and his drug addiction. But 
he's not the only person to write about the experiences that formed him. Stephen King is famous, and he has biographers. And there's a story that they put in biographies that he never shares in his memoirs. When he was little, he watched one of his friends get hit by a train. According to biographers, this was a formative experience, and it made him into a horror writer. I don't know. Maybe. What struck me about this is that stories about Stephen King, even stories he tells about himself, answer the following question. What's wrong with him? Ever since I realized that was the theme of stories about Stephen King, I started looking for it in stories that people who write or who love horror tell about themselves. And with rare exception, I usually find it. It's almost like there are genre conventions for this kind of story. Now, I'm not sure if Stephen King does believe there's something wrong with him. What I think is he knows what you expect to hear when he tells you a story about his life. I think Stephen King is telling you the story you want to hear. I love horror myself. Obviously, I'm doing a whole video on why I love a horror game. So, what's wrong with me? Let's put a pin in that. Pathologic 2's opening promises you will fail. And it keeps that promise. You need to eat. You need to sleep. You need to pick a time to sleep when nothing's going on so you don't miss important events. So, unless you know the game, like, really know it. Something has to give. One of your primary goals is saving specific characters. Again, mostly children. You can boost their immunity with store-bought pills or with tinctures you make yourself. But there's really nothing that increases their immunity beyond about 80%. Once they get sick, you can treat them with antibiotics to increase their chances. But even that isn't a sure thing. Early on, the only reliable way to save anyone once they're infected is a medicine called a schmouter. They're these crushed pills that you can find for barter with little girls or in chests around town. Sometimes. Oh hey, it's the fellow traveler from the train. And he's buying organs. Good thing I'm carrying. They spawn so rarely that you really hesitate to use them. But... If you don't, at midnight, any named character who's infected is subject to a dice roll versus the plague. And if they lose... So I start looking for schmatters early in the game. You can find at least one before the outbreak by completing a quest. <sighs> this guy's gonna try and kill me. I also start hoarding ammo. Not because I have a gun. Guns are too expensive, and they jam too often to be worth it early on. But because ammo is small and it's expensive, and it goes up in value quickly once the plague hits. And ammo's easy to get. You can dig scraps of metal out of the trash and then trade those to small boys, so it's cheap and ethical to get a hold of. Then you sell the ammo for food. Easy. At least until rationing hits. I've got a minute. Frankly, I've never gotten through a run without spending most of my early game hoarding food. And while there are in-game hints you should do this, mostly from a guy offering you a sweet deal on a bull that totally talks, he swears it just won't talk to you, I bought a talking bull. Thanks for waiting? Fuck. That's only foreshadowing if you know for sure what's coming. So there's what the character you're playing knows, and there's what I the player known. This is a difficult game, but a perfect run where nobody dies is possible. Well, it's... I mean, it It can be done, I promise. If you know how to do it, it's not any more difficult than getting all the rings in a Mario game. But Artemy Barak, the character, would have no reason to know how to do it. There's also spectacularly little incentive to avoid failure. 
Unlike most games where failure walls off content, you see more of the game when you fail. You have dreams where your friends and wards forgive you or reproach you. Failure also changes how you perceive the game. There's this nice scene early on where you gather your childhood friends to begin reconciling a rift between you. It's this great, quiet narrative moment. The plague has just started. Shit is about to hit the fan. And you're setting aside your differences. This took work. I had to run around town to ask them to show up. On this run-through, I ended up not doing a main quest, and one of the kids I was looking after got sick because I was doing this instead. This cost me something to see. And in a game where that's possible, where you have knowledge of other playthroughs where this didn't happen, this scene hits very different. So, in the strictest Pavlovian sense, the game rewards failure. But, strangely, the result of that, for me, is that I feel so much more devastated when I do fail. There was this one run-through where I didn't make it in time to give Taya Tai Chi, who is six, a schmouter. Um, I hadn't planned my run through, and I ran out of food and I was starving. She died. I had to go take a break, get a cup of tea. No other game has affected me like that. And Yes, it is because it's well-made, but it's also because of who I am. 2019 was a bad year for me, and 2020, for obvious reasons, was worse. At the beginning of the pandemic, my therapist asked me to list my coping strategies, and Pathologic 2 did make the list. It wasn't the top, but it was there. And she asked me about it. Um, I don't know what I was expecting. She told me to maybe take a break. Um, and this was fair of her. I had PTSD. I have PTSD. And at the time, I had lost my job. Partially because of the pandemic, but also because I wasn't attending work the way I needed to. I'm getting older, and the stuff I used to be able to power through, I just can't anymore. When I'm tired, I'm in more pain. When I'm in pain, I don't sleep. When I don't sleep, I'm more anxious. When I'm more anxious, I get flashbacks. All of these factors made it so much more difficult for me to just get through the day. So I wasn't doing well. And it made sense for my therapist to really challenge me on whether what I was doing to get through my life was working. I took her advice. I took a step back from playing Pathologic, at least while there was a crisis going on. But I also kind of took a step back from my therapist. Beyond failing to save someone or not doing a quest in time, there's another kind of failure. Your own death. But your death also isn't the end. You wake up in the theater to be lectured by Mark Immortel. He starts penalizing you. Usually it's a few points off your health or your stamina. These are permanent penalties. They get written onto every save in a playthrough all the way back to the beginning of the game, so you can't just reload. Once, and this really got to me, the penalty is that he takes away your ability to hug. It's one of the first things he takes from you. At that fireside meeting you organize, Laura needs a hug. And of course she does. There's a plague. And you just can't. After you've died over and over and over, the fellow traveler, the coffin man from the tutorial, 
shows up in the theater instead of Mark and Mortel. Instead of taking some of your life or damaging your psychological ability to be close to other people, he offers you a deal. He'll take away the consequences of your failures, no more penalties, in exchange for something. So there's this repeated return to the theater. It's where you work each day. At midnight, there are surreal plays that function like Greek choruses, commenting on the action or telling the future. It's where you go when you die. This underlines a major theme of the game, performance. Calling attention to a theater performance as a performance within the context of a play is called Brechtian, after director and philosopher Bertolt Brecht. The midnight review of what happened during the day on a text card, the fourth wall breaks, the use of stagehands to point you in the right direction, or to tell you other characters' thoughts, all count as Brechtian. As in theater, these techniques have an intended function, to alienate you from immersion in the story. You are not meant to identify as Arnie Barak. You're meant to take your experiences as a player the knowledge you know, but Artemy can't. To get through the game. In fact, it's the only way to get through it. Actually, that's only partially true. I could have let Ruben, my Artemy Brock's childhood friend, die. Uh, and... There's no consequences if you do. He's not story essential. Um, he's not even that good a friend. So why am I doing this? Why would I put myself through this? This is hard and a little bit unpleasant. These people aren't real, and if they don't live, it's not going to change my life. What am I performing here? In my own life, I think a lot about performativity. I'm non-binary, and I'm not what you'd call neurotypical. Uh, I, of course, have PTSD, and I have a head injury that I got simultaneous to the trauma that gave me PTSD. I also was, about 30 years ago, diagnosed with some sensory integration issues that, if I'd been evaluated for them today, almost certainly would have resulted in an autism diagnosis. As a result of those ways in which I'm not neurotypical, I don't necessarily intuitively know how to do all the performances I'm expected to do. And some of them I really want to do. I mean, I want to be engaging, I want to be likable, I want people to know that I love them. And that means that I have to perform certain actions that let them know that I feel that way about them. Um, but there are other roles, like woman, that I feel really uncomfortable in. Judith Butler, in her book Gender Trouble, says that gender is performative. Now, that's slightly different than saying it's a performance. When we say gender is performative, that means there's a way you present yourself to the world, not all of it intentional, like you're not always on. But either way, these behaviors are categorized as womanly or mannish by society. Then. Other people give you feedback on your assigned role and how well you fit it. You react to that feedback and then get feedback on that reaction. In other words, it's a continual forging of an identity as part of a conversation. I find performativity theory really useful in explaining some specific ways I have difficulties. Now I want to pause here. I'm only speaking about my experience. Please don't stereotype other non-binary people based on this. Thank you very much. My two difficulties are, one, 
that I don't really feel comfortable in the role of woman. It doesn't make me happy. It feels kind of like a hair shirt. And second, that when people reflect back on me that based on my role as a woman, they have certain expectations of me. I have trouble understanding those expectations, and I have even more trouble meeting them as a result. Now, there are a lot of trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming people who are also autistic. In fact, it's kind of a common line of attack from transphobes to say, maybe you're not actually trans. Maybe you're just autistic. And my response to that is, well, maybe I am just autistic. But if that's the case, if it's neurological, that's my body. You know, my brain is in my body. My neurological system is in my body. So what am I supposed to do about that? Your two main goals are first to solve your dad's murder and the other to inherit your father's legacy, to become a Manku, and also to find out what the hell a Manku is. It's really roughly translated as folk doctor, but as time goes on, you learn it's kind of a hybrid priest, leader, doctor. You're the only person permitted to break certain taboos. You can cut open a body, butcher meat, dig deeply into the earth. You start seeing the world as miraculous and take on the weight of saving your people. Not just from the plague. Nearly all of the kin are trapped in a giant building called the Termitary. It's housing attached to a slaughterhouse where they work. You don't know why they were locked in the Termitary early on. It was locked before the plague hit. But rumor has it that the Olgimskis, one of the three ruling families, headed off an anticipated strike through forced lockdown. The industrial business of the town, the Bull Enterprise, is headed by Vlad Olgimsky and his family. The Olgimskis are commerce overlords. The two other ruling families aren't as central to Artemis' narrative, but they exert a similar level of control over the town. The Keynes have built the town as part of a utopian project to change the way people think and the limits of their imagination. Hence, the polyhedron, the impossible tower the town's children are enthralled with. The Sabarovs, the third ruling family, have imposed order on the town. Governor Sabarov deputizes police and is investigating your father's murder. These three families impose their own image onto your indigenous people and their land. You can still visit a traditional village on the outskirts of town. The skin tents are still up, which means this was a way of life they were living a generation or two ago, at most. When you finally get inside the termitary, the plague is here, as is starvation. Most of the people inside have died, including one of the leaders of the kin, who you've been trying to talk to. His daughter, Tai Tai Cheek, is now their mother's superior, a religious figurehead. Did I mention she's six? Artemy finds this alarming. She's not a precocious six, she's six six. So how is she leading? Well, members of the kin don't see themselves as individuals. She's not the boss like industrialist Vlad. She's the head of the bull. Unlike the ruling families who place themselves over the town, Taya, by contrast, literally doesn't know the word alone. The key to solving the mystery of who killed your father, why they did it, is to stop seeing the plague as separate from the town, from its recent industrialization and the new and impossible building stabbing into the living earth. It's to stop seeing the origin of the plague and your father's murder as separate mysteries, but as part of a contiguous whole. You find two ways to end the plague, two different endings. Whichever one you pick, you win. It just depends on what kind of future you want. Remember when this guy offered me a deal to spare me the penalties for dying? I took it.
That means I don't get an ending. That's what I traded away. So this is how the game ends, with everything undone. PTSD lies to me. It says, if I don't go anywhere, don't trust anyone, don't feel anything, I can't get hurt. I'll be who I was before. But all of that is me. What I carry is who I am. The fellow traveler took away the consequences of the bad things that happened to me on this run-through. But when I finally accomplished something worthwhile, he took that from me too. So, <laughs> narrative obligation fulfilled. Bummer achieved. Um, I have told the story that people expect of horror fans and queer people and mentally ill people. This is what people want to hear. When I first started recovery, I really had a difficult time with it because I had to challenge everything about me, about myself, whether it was healthy, whether it was good. And unfortunately, is this healthy or is she just sick? Is the same question that people ask about me when they don't like me and they don't want me to succeed. When I chose that framing, what's wrong with me? I set myself on a path where I was inevitably going to dredge something up, come up with an answer, even if there's not that much wrong with me. So, let's unask the question. We started with the idea that I must like pain, but is that really true? I have a severe needle phobia. I hadn't managed to get a shot in about 20 years, but I'd worked on it really hard the last three or four in therapy. Still, it was really up in the air whether I could get vaccinated. I did it. My husband cheered and I laughed and all the nurses in earshot, we were at this big stadium place, heard and they also cheered. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. Does that mean that the shot, which was sore for a few days, was pleasurable? Well, let's ask the hedonists. Specifically the philosophical school, not the gentle perverts of the world, although there is some overlap. The hedonists distinguish between pleasure, the physical feeling, and cognitive pleasure, which is any desirable mental state. So, even though the shot physically hurt, I took pleasure in overcoming a phobia. This same logic can apply to aesthetics. And really, if we're going to discuss art, who better to look to than a school of thought devoted to pleasure? Hume, who highly influenced later hedonists, was writing about 70 years before horror really gelled as a genre. But he does have an essay on tragedy. And in it, he points out that even the distinction between pleasure and pain is maybe fuzzier than some like to admit. Pleasure and pain says he, which are two sentiments so different in themselves, differ not so much in their cause. From the instance of tickling, it appears that the movement of pleasure pushed a little too far becomes pain, and that the movement of pain, a little moderated, becomes pleasure. Hence it proceeds that there is such a thing as a sorrow, soft and agreeable.
something can startle me or make my gut squirm or make me cry and still feel good both mentally and physically, especially cognitively, I can still admire it as a piece of craft. Just by how I choose to think about something, I can turn something painful into something I take genuine joy in. So, earlier on, I said that my therapist suggested, um, at least while we were in the middle of a crisis, that I take a step back from playing Pathologic 2. And I did withdraw from the relationship for a couple of months as a result of that. In retrospect, I think the reason why was because I genuinely loved the game very much. And I was being protective of my joy. I didn't want it to be medicalized. I didn't want it to be dissected. And I think that's a really healthy impulse. I didn't pick the game back up until after I was vaccinated. And I still thought about it every day. Pathologic 2 has a lot to say about persevering in hopeless situations. It talks a lot about living through a pandemic. And I needed that. And that's one of the best things about horror. Horror finds meaning and beauty in some of the worst experiences in life. And I mean, look at this thing. It's gorgeous. It's beautifully written. That's enough. I got treatment for my PTSD. I went into a part-time intensive program, and I'm doing better. I still experience myself as other, in part because other people tell me I'm an other, can't get away from that. And I think that probably does influence how much I enjoy horror. In many ways, horror is a mode that explores and even celebrates the other. But aside from that, it just makes me happy. And my happiness doesn't need to be picked apart because it doesn't require any further justification. If you don't take the deal, there are two endings. The Earth is alive. The plague is just an immune response to the pollution of the town and the polyhedron stabbing into the Earth. If you find a cure to the plague, the army will be at your disposal to enact one of two possible solutions. In the first ending, you leave the polyhedron in place and shell the town, whose pollution and digging for the sake of development has harmed the earth. Miracles return in force. But the non-indigenous adults and the older children wander off into the wilderness and perish. The plague will come back generation after generation. In the second ending, you choose to shell the polyhedron. This rips the knife out of the wound and the earth bleeds out. An attack on the miraculous floating tower is an attack on the miraculous itself. Miracles, including the plague, die. But the town and its people live. This ending is the one that I think the text of the game heavily favors. In the end, Pathologic 2 isn't a game about futility. It's a game about performing persistence in the face of futility. And what better definition of hope is there? This was a hard game. And it's been a hard year for everyone. But surviving was worth it. Acknowledgements. Thanks to Eric Hain and John Greenaway for voicing Stephen King and David Hume, respectively, and for all their encouragement. This video wouldn't have happened without them. Thank you.
Additionally, I should mention that Philosophy Tube's video on Jordan Peterson covers Brecht and the Hedonists in a little more depth. I also have a philosophy background, but it'd feel wrong not to mention. I also want to thank H. Bomber Guy for his video on the first pathologic. It's one of my favorites on this website, and I wouldn't have thought to do a video on this at all if I hadn't seen his. I also just launched a Patreon, and to my immense shock, I mean, as in, I recorded this specially because I didn't expect it, I have patrons. And if you see the people who are highlighted in yellow, that means that they gave it the highest tier, so an extra special thanks to them. You can find my Patreon link down below in the description. I think I'm also supposed to say like, comment, subscribe, so I'm saying that here. Anyway, I'm going to get off the mic now. Um, good night, or good morning, wherever you are.